Hello, this is the AI Lab. Today it's my pleasure to welcome Derek Slater, a tech policy strategist focused on media, communications, and information policy. Derek is the co-founder of Proteus Strategies and previously worked at Google and at the Electronic Frontier Foundation on issues related to access to information, content regulation, and online safety. The reason? A recent blog post written by Derek on the Tech Policy website, entitled What the Copyright Case Against Ed Sheeran Can Teach Us About AI. Let's hear what Derek has to say. So, Derek, um, my first question is going to be about creativity and legal boundaries. So, in the Ed Sheeran case and in similar disputes, how should we define the boundary between protectable expression and unprotectable building blocks in music or in any creative field? And what lessons can this offer for generative AI? Yeah. So first, maybe let's talk about the Ed Sheeran case itself. Um, you know, I was very surprised to see this is still going on after seven years. But to give folks the background, Ed Sheeran has been accused of uh, infringing on the rights in the Marvin Gaye song, Let's Get It On, or the very famous song. And he's been sued by two sets of people who own rights in the composition. He's, Ed Sheeran has won at, in, before jury and before court, but this is now up on appeal. Um, and what specifically he's accused of doing is using a, a chord progression and a harmonic rhythm that are part of Let's Get It On. Um, you know, the, the rights holders say, you used our stuff without consent. Um, but a jury found and a judge held that, look, these chord progressions, these harmonic rhythms are part of the basic building blocks of music. And moreover, right, all creativity builds on the past. All songs are made up of a limited number of notes and chords available to the composers. That's what the, the judge said. And he continued saying to protect their combination would give Let's Get It On an impermissible monopoly. And that's, that's a really important point. And that's why copyright has always allowed certain uses of existing content, existing material, by drawing lines between protectable expression and unprotectable ideas, facts, and other elements. That's one of the ways that copyright allows use of existing materials. So rights holders can demand consent for some uses, but they are not allowed to enclose and cut off the basic building blocks of culture and knowledge. Now, in terms of how you draw that line specifically, as in all things with copyright, it can be complicated and nuanced, and it differs across jurisdiction. But the point is that we have years of rulings and law and cases to go on. So your, your question, and when it comes to generative AI, we're actually not starting from scratch, right? Generative AI raises a similar issue. When we're thinking about large language models, they're doing, a you know, to build them, it's a big statistical analysis of lots and lots of texts to derive rules about syntax and how different concepts are related to each other and facts about the world. Same with generative AI for music. It's, you know, analyzing lots and lots of music in order to, tease out those you know basic building blocks as was discussed in the Ed Sheeran case and you know there will be some hard line drawing here that will come in with generative AI but we have those uh, precedents and that legal sort of outline to to build on and at, at the very least what we know is this issue can't be re reduced to the simplicity of consent or not because the question is consent for what right is it consent for of course you need consent for certain uses of protectable expression but deriving insights, deriving uh, uncopyrightable elements from protectable expression generally can be permissible. So I think that's the grounding here. We, you know, there's not one bright line, but we do have a lot of case law and knowledge and history to go on. Uh, thank you, Derek. So, so when people say this is like a whole new field and we need to reinvent the rules, no, maybe we should be, maybe like in music, we should be building on what's there already. <laughs> <laughs> and, yeah. and, and move forward and, and understand that nothing exists on its own in isolation. Let's put it that way. That's right. So moving to the second question that um, came to my mind when I read your blog post, and that is consent versus enclosure. So can, can you explain what you mean by enclosure and how you think we can balance the principles of consent and enclosure in regulating AI tools that rely on existing creative works. Uh, I mean, basically, 
what are the principles that should guide policymakers to ensure that copyright does not stifle innovation and creativity and actually does the contrary, that it you know, fulfills its purpose? Sure. And I think to step back from sort of the music case for a second and to think about enclosure, you know, imagine if you know, certain you know, facts about the world, you know, the temperature outside or you know, things like E equals MC squared could be controlled, owned by a single person, right? That would be taking something that is in the public domain um, and taking it out and providing it as property to a person. When we talk about copyright, that's effectively what it's doing. It's saying these things that otherwise might be in the public domain that could be shared and built on freely, we're gonna give a property right to someone. Now, that can be good, right? The core of copyright, the, the purpose of it is creating incentives for people to create for the public's benefit. Um, so that, you know, closure can be justified, but we also have always recognized that there are downsides to it, to taking something and meaning that the public can no longer freely build on and use it. And so there have always been limits. And again, that's, you know, limits on what's protectable expression. It's other limitations and exceptions for educational uses or news reporting or in the U.S. fair use that terms expire, right? That when a work is old enough, it is made, it goes fully into the public domain. So we've always had that both, you know, the, the copyrights protections, but also limits. So that, that enclosure hopefully doesn't go too far. And when people, you know, talk about when it is ethical, let alone legal to use some piece of information, we always need to ask, right? Is it ethical for people to enclose this information? When is it unethical to stop people from using you know, the temperature, you know, saying, repeating that the temperature outside or e equals MC squared or using that basic building block of language or music, because that information, that knowledge, those cultural artifacts ought to belong to the public. So in terms of principles, where does that leave us? I think from a copyright perspective, the first key principle is, you know, is this protection necessary, this enclosure necessary in order to encourage creativity for the public's benefit, right? creativity is already booming, it's abundant, it would happen anyway, and this doesn't interfere with it, then th there should not be an issue there. Um, I think the second sort of related piece, um, once you go a bit deeper, is, is the use involved about facilitating new creativity or about communicating an expression that directly substitutes for the existing work that it's using? So, you know, when we think about generative AI, these are tools for productivity, for creativity, not for piracy fundamentally, right? They're not about um, simply reusing the works that they were trained on in the outputs. And in fact, that's considered you know, a bug, a failure mode and something to be avoided. Um, that doesn't mean that there can't ever be issues of infringement in the outputs or even in the models, right? You could imagine a large language model that's trained on all of Harry Potter for the express commercial purpose of helping you create and sell your own Harry Potter books, right? That would be a very different fact pattern than you know, what you see with chat GPT and, 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 and the like, right? And so I think we have to look very carefully in terms of principles is, is what's happening here a use to substitute directly for the expression, not just you know creating language or creating music that happens to be in the same market because we want to, the copyright's purpose is to incentivize more creativity, right? When somebody uses a tool like Suno or Udio to create a new song, that's very much in line with copyright's purpose. The only place where it crosses the line is when or where it should cross the line is where that output actually is directly substituting, reusing um, that communicative expression embodied in some specific work. Thank you. I think that that's a, a nice way to set the scene. Let me now move to the technological impact on art. So given the historical examples of photocopiers, iPods, uh, I'm being old now by, by quoting these, and, and other technologies that initially faced backlash, but ultimately revolutionized creative industries. How do you envision the long-term impact of generative AI on music and artistic expression? Yeah, I mean, so on the one hand, I, I, I don't know, rather we should have humility about what will actually catch on in terms of what shapes our culture, what proves useful to people creating. Um, I think one way to think about it is, you know, is this sort of like the, you know, the synthesizer or like computer generated graphics or Photoshop where, 
you know, at first, um, there was a lot of people said, this is not, you know, this is not music. This is not art. Um, and over time, it became integrated into artistic processes in a variety of ways. And now you don't think of something of like, you know, this is, you don't go to the movie theater, theater and see something labeled as this is a CGI movie. This is a computer graphics movie. I mean, sure, you some may rely on computer graphics more than others, but it's just sort of part of artistic processes. And I think this may be similar, that it may be anachronistic in not too long to have the idea that, oh, this is Gen AI art, right? It just might be something um, connected within. As an example of that, you know, consider that um, you know, Oscar winner from last year, everything ever all at once. Use the generative AI tool Runway to do editing in one of its more famous scenes. You know, nobody knew that that was generative AI at the time. Nobody said, oh, this is a generative AI movie, but it was part of their artistic process. And I think that's, you know, more where we're head. You know, from sort of the more, the thing about the policy perspective and the, the impacts around creators and creativity, I think the key thing to start with is that to acknowledge that generative AI is driving an abundance of creativity. From the perspective of copyright, it's great, right? Copyright is to incentivize creativity. So that the ch fundamentally is not at odds with the, the issues of copyright. And indeed, I think most of the concerns that people have aren't really copyright problems. Um, that said, I do get the concerns, right? I think a lot of creators are worried about if, um, how will the benefits of this technology really be spread? Will they be concentrated among a few big companies or will they really benefit a large amount of people, including creators? And in particular, will this be used to sort of automate people out of a job like those are relevant questions i think those are questions that apply far broader than just the arts and creativity when it comes to ai and they demand sort of solutions and approaches that look beyond copyright that think about more holistically how do we want to think about the role of automation in our society to make sure it really does drive widely shared benefits and not just concentrated benefits for a few companies thank you derek i think that's that um really explains your article in, in actually in more detail probably than the, than the article. So the TLDR is a bit of a, a, mis a misnomer here. But um, we look forward to reading more of, of your analysis. And, you know, we're living exciting times. So we'll see, we'll see what prevails. Uh, I'm pretty sure creativity is always what prevails at the end anyway. In, indeed. I, I, I uh, you know, again, I think it is important to engage with the concerns of creators and try and think about how we make the benefits widely shared. But as a fan, I feel like we were in a golden era. Now we just need to make sure really those benefits are widely shared. So yeah, great to talk about it. Always happy to. Okay, thank you.